I'm Andrew Budd. I'm founder and CEO of London-based iProve. We're specialists in the biometric verification of faces and liveness. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a 45-minute uh, presentation. So hold on to your hats, please. And then we're, I'm going to sit down with Dave Birch, and we're going to we're going to have another 45-minute Josh in 10 minutes. In my presentation, to begin with, I'm going to talk about three things. One is, what is happening to the architectures of digital identity? What do you need to know about what's happening to digital identity? I'm going to talk about the real and growing threats to authentication that not many people realize or know about. And thirdly, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons we've learned about ingredients for success. As I talk about uh, the architectures for identity, I promise you I have not coordinated with Anne Lee. The fact that what we're about to say is so extraordinarily uh, aligned is because that is the way that the industry is moving. The industry has gone from a centralized model of identity, typically government issued, that's in the bottom left. It's moved towards a federated model, that is lots of identity providers talking to each other, sometimes commercially managed, and the EIDAS-1 standard in Europe is a typical example of that. But what we are moving to in many countries is an individually controlled, decentralized model, which uh, sometimes is called decentralized identity, um, distributed identity. It, in some places, it grew out of a, an almost political movement called self-sovereign identity, but nobody talks about that anymore. And that has many of the characteristics that Anne Lee was talking about. What are, uh, what, what is user-centric identity? User-centric identity takes the information about a person out of a central store, and it puts it under the control of the user and only the user. And then trusted organizations like J.P. Morgan Chase put these attributes, create trusted attributes, digitally signed, they put them into the identity wallet, and then the user, and only the user, can assert those attributes in a cryptographically proven way to whoever needs to know about it. That's a, a radical shift in the way in which identity flows through the system. And in centralized and federated models, it does not work like this at all. In centralized and federated models, all the, digi all the information about you, the biographic information, and as Anne Lee said, some of your preference and activity information, actually is stored in a big central database, which often is under the control of the people on the right, the aligned party. So this is a radical revolution, and it's going to affect the entire content and communications community, which is why it's so relevant to us all here today. <clears throat> but no such transition is complete without a bit of standards tension, and there are two standards. On the one hand, there is an open standard created by the W3C consortium known as uh, the Verifiable Credentials, today Verifiable Credentials 1.1, which is to be used in the European ID wallet. And then there's a much more limited standard known as the Mobile Driving Licence, which comes out of an ISO standard. And that has much more scope to be controlled by, by large tech vendors. So we're going to start to see a bit of a tension building up as to whether relying parties are going to have to, about whether the entire identity ecosystem is going to rely upon W3C credentials or upon mobile driving licenses. And the outcome of that will be very material for all of you here in the audience. I want to move now on to, uh, to, to address a confusion that exists sometimes in the market, because people talk about identity and authentication as though they were the same problem, and they're not. Identity, digital identity, is a little bit like a, a folder, a dossier of information about you. I see it as being uh, like, a like a file on a desk somewhere with bits of information going into it. And the centralized and federated identity providers, they have filing cabinets, whereas in the uh, distributed identity environment, you carry that file around with you, but it's just a set of facts. And trust doesn't reside in facts. Trust resides on in what happens, what goes on between the ears of individuals. So at some point, you have to bind that identity, that set of facts about a person, to a real, live, living human being. And that process of binding the identity to a person is what we call uh, authentication. And it's a very different problem, and it's a very significant problem. Today, more and more faces being used to do that. Why? Well, because a lot of the key trusted facts today are in the form of a government identity. Put out your government identity. What is the only thing that shows that you are the owner, the bearer of that identity? It's that face. The face occupies a very special place because it's the only thing that today binds a government-issued identity to the bearer. Um, it's also incredibly usable. Uh, every, per every person's device has a front-facing camera, which is all you need, and all you have to do is look at your device and it looks back at you. So it's ubiquitous and it's incredibly accessible. 
The great thing about a face is it's unlike a password or some or a, a good encryption or some sort of hardware key. Uh, it's physically attached to the front of your skull, which is bolted onto your shoulders. So it can't be stolen, at least not without a very sharp knife and a lot of blood, excuse me. Um, and it can't be copied. I mean, it can be copied, but the genuine article is unique. The genuine article is unique, and that's what makes it special, providing you can check the genuineness. Then the question is, well, do you check it on the device or do you check it in the cloud? That's a whole discussion. We sustain that it's much safer and much more flexible for the individual to store it on the, in the cloud, if nothing else, because when you drop your phone into the toilet, as my son did a while ago, or when someone steals it from you in the street, as happened to a friend of mine a few days ago, you don't lose your whole identity and your whole ability to authenticate. So the question is, what does this look like? I want to show you a 15-second video of what an onboarding process powered by strong document capture and powered by strong face verification looks like. This is Joe Palmer, uh, iProof's uh, chief product officer, and that's his phone on the right. So the first thing he's going to do is uh, he's going to assert his, he's going to capture his uh, identity, in this case, uh, a Maryland driving license. Shows the front, shows the back, driving license is red. The photograph has been captured off that. Now he's going to verify his face. He pulls, puts his face into the oval, doesn't have to do anything, no instructions or anything. Those flashing lights are illuminating his face with a one-time code, and we're analyzing the reflections of the light from his face. That was done. What you just saw was a, an extremely strong, high level of assurance onboarding, which is as good as or better than an in-person presentation. How long did it take? 30 seconds? How easy was it to do? Very easy. This, is now, this method is now being used by millions of people worldwide, by the governments that we serve, the government of the United States, the UK government, the Australian government, the Singapore government, banks like UBS, ABSA Bank, banks all, over the, banks all over the world. Why the flashing lights? Well, we have to mitigate some threats. There are three things that make face verification difficult. First, you've got to make sure it's the right person. Face matching technology does that brilliantly. It's a solved problem. Secondly, you've got to make sure it's a real person and not an artifact, something thrust in front of the screen like that plastic mask that my wife absolutely refuses to have in the house. That, frankly, is also a pretty solved problem, and it matters decreasingly. This is yesterday's problem. What really matters are digital injection attacks. Digital injection attacks are is synthetic imagery which has been created to resemble the victim or the non-existent person that you're trying to present, and it's fed directly into the data stream um, of the verifying process. Indistinguishable to the naked eye, completely lacking any of the cues that a, a camera-led presentation attack has, and infinitely scalable. Infinitely scalable. Tens of thousands of attacks can be mounted uh, over a very short time. Well, you can say that sounds all very theoretical. Is it happening? Yes, it is happening. Uh, we've recently published our um, biometric threat report, and we've identified three key, three key trends. Firstly, we've seen digital injection attacks increase by 150%, uh, a ha uh, half on half. Digital injection attacks are growing with incredible rapidity, and they are, have already rapidly overtaken legacy liveness attacks, presentation attacks, things put in front of the camera. Last year's problem, digital injection attacks are the way that hackers are, hackers, and by hackers I mean national security organizations, organized crime gangs, not kids in their, in their bedroom, are attempting to spoof identity verification systems today. Secondly, we're seeing the emergence of novel attacks, in particularly face swap. Attacker may themselves sit in front of a camera once, they do everything that is being asked of them, for example, in the video items, and they just put somebody else's face on top of them. Modern deepfake technology makes that indistinguishable for naked eye. We've seen an explosion of that, three, th a tripling over the last half. And finally, what we're seeing is attackers using classic cyber security, cyber, cyber attack methods, developing attacks that work on one method and then spraying it across every service they can find worldwide at enormous volume. So the evolution of an attack which finds a vulnerable exploit can be terrifyingly fast. If you're relying on a weak system which has been broken somewhere, you won't get any warning. You'll be broken, and you'll be asked, as I once was on television, in British television, 15 years ago in a different context, were you complicit or just recklessly incompetent? How do we know this? We run something called the iProof Security Operations Center. This is a back-end security operations center. Every single verification of the hundreds of millions that we do worldwide comes back into our central systems where they're triaged automatically. 
and signals of threat are, are, are extracted and we're able to watch, to identify and watch the novel attack modes. Attackers engaging in attack sequences. We're able to study what they do, how they're doing it, and develop defenses against these new and emerging threats. It's kind of obvious if you're running a cyber security system that this is what you do. We're the only company in the world that does it, and it's that that gives us the visibility that you've seen today. So our job is to establish trust in remote users. We do this for governments and banks worldwide, uh, and our job is to keep users, organizations, governments and societies safe. Just to finish, some of the things we've learned, and again, this chimes very well with what Anne Lee said, in order to have, provide sex, you have to give agency to users, you have to give them choice, you have to give them control, you have to give them a feeling that they can choose or not choose, and you have to be transparent about what it is that they are choosing. Choice is key to this. Clear regulation, essential. I'm not going to start on that peroration there, or I'll be really will be here for 45 minutes. The most of the thing I'll leave it with, leave you with is when you're devising these journeys, don't burden the consumer. Every time I hear that consumers have to be educated, uh, my hair stands on end, which is pretty impressive, let me tell you. Um, because with the way, consumers do not want to be educated. It's our job as vendors, it's our job as industries and suppliers to do the hard, the heavy lifting for them in order to keep them safe, in order to enable them to assert and use their identity freely and safely, ubiquitously. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I would like to invite onto the stage um, for a fireside chat the legendary uh, identity expert, David Birch, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, you should leave the room because you shouldn't be in any kind of a meeting uh, on, on identity if you, don't, no, if you don't know who David Birch is and haven't heard him speak before. Um, uh, part, part incredibly respected industry guru and part stand-up comedian. Um, <laughs> but uh, he will explain things to you far better than I ever can. David, just to begin with, um, I have just, in a few minutes, tried to, uh, s tried to thoroughly frighten the audience about the threats that emerging new technologies present to liveness and the, threat that, and the threats that broken liveness present to the whole future of digital identity. Am I overstating it? No, I mean, we, we have to have the fundamental anchor between the digital identity and the things in the real world, whether that's people or anything else. That has to be there, and, and liveness is a good way uh, of achieving that. But the, the manifestations of the problem are, are spreading. So, so the point is, it used to be, you know, I, I would need it to get a bank account or something. Well, in fact, I, you know, you do need it to get a bank account. You do that thing where you scan your driving license and look. I mean, I've done that a, a few times. I, I got turned down, actually, but there was a, uh, it doesn't matter. I got my wife to do it anyway, so, so she did it. She got turned down as well, actually, but that was because her driving license had expired, so she couldn't open a savings account. It wasn't entirely clear to me how good you are at driving is anything to do with how good you are at running a savings account, but it's a bank thing. I don't understand all of that. Um, but now it's everything. You look at the fuss that's been going on with Twitter. Over the, I don't know if any of you still... It, it's big with the kids. It's a social media thing. And, and the thing is, one of Elon's complaints about it when he took it over was that the value of it was limited because you didn't know whether you were talking to a person or not. You didn't know whether it was a person or a bot. Now, actually, for a great many things, it doesn't matter whether it's a person or a bot. Like, if I'm, if I'm talking to the bank, I just, like, this happened the other day, you know, you do the chat thing on the bank. I prefer the chat thing because I'm old. You know, when you phone them up, well, first of all, I can't be bothered to wait however long it takes. To, but also, you can't always hear them properly. And on the chat thing, you know, it's kind of written down for you. So I prefer the sort of... So the, but the point is, I don't care if I'm talking to chat GPT or a person. It's immaterial. I just want to know, like, where do I find the IBAN or whatever it was I was looking for? So in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. But in some pretty serious cases, it does. And this issue of whether you're actually connecting to a person or not is becoming one of the most important aspects of the identity space. Now... Note to your point, the difference between the identity and the individual. Like, if I'm connecting to the bank, and for some, I can't imagine why, but for some reason, I need to know I'm talking to a person and not a robot, right? Let's say that. I don't need to know which person I'm talking to. I just need to know it's a person. 
this is where Twitter and people have got this all mixed up because they're jumbling up. Is it a person? With which person is it? Like the important thing for Twitter isn't that I'm Dave, but it's that I'm a person. It doesn't matter which person. Just knowing I'm a person is really the most important credential. Which, by the way, J.P. Morgan know. Like one of the things they do know is that I'm a person. So like an obvious way to do that would be when I go and create an account at Twitter, just bounce me to J.P. Morgan and I'll log in at J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan can tell him it's a person. Like it's none of Twitter's business who I am. They just need to know I'm a person, right? And you see this extending now into things like Meta, for example. The other, like now Meta is Facebook. Remember that thing before TikTok? Anyone? Facebook. It's very big, but it's big with older people. You, but maybe not the people in this audience. But now Facebook Meta is it? Now they're gonna, you know, the blue tick on Twitter. Who's got a blue tick on Twitter? Just out of curiosity, is this a? Is this an informed or no? These are nobodies. These are nobodies here in the. So no. So, but some of you will get. Who's gonna pay, Who's gonna pay to get a blue tick on Meta? Not me. You're gonna pay. You're insane. Meta should be paying you to get a blue tick, right? It's Meta that doesn't know whether you're a person or who you are. This is why Amazon's revenue is. Their, their advertising revenue is up what two thousand percent over the past five years because Amazon know who you are. They know you're a person. Facebook don't know who you are. That's why they they need to know who, you, in fact, like Twitter needs to know you're a person. Facebook wants to know who you are as well. They should be paying you for a blue tick. You're increasing their value by knowing that. So the point is, the liveness thing used to be about just getting a bank account. Now the liveness thing is about the way we do business in the future. I just came from the metaverse session. Did anyone go to the metaverse session earlier on? It's a very incurious as well, aren't they? That's the old thing about this group. Um, so it's like it's happening to other people, this revolution. Um, but anyway, I was in the metaverse thing a bit earlier. They weren't really talking about the metaverse. They were talking about virtual worlds the whole time, which is a different thing. But in the metaverse, it's going to become crucial in some circumstances. Do I really know it's the bank? Do I really know it's a person? The number of circumstances where do I really need to know it's this person is really rather limited. And that's why we should be using a proper digital identity infrastructure, back to your point about credentials and MDLs, rather than having people identify themselves all the time. The more you make people identify yourselves, who's heard of Optus? Let's try something simpler, something telecom -y. Who's heard of Optus? Thank you very much. Okay, I mean, I've never met you before in my life, sir, have I? No. So Optus, remember there was that massive Optus breach before Christmas where basically everybody in Australia had their personal data stolen from Optus? including all their passport data, which meant the passport checking service had to be turned off. It was pointless because now everyone's passport data was in the hands of everybody. So there was no point using it. And you have to sort of wonder, why did Optus have people's passport data? Like, to your point, I mean, is it because they were stupid or fundamentally incompetent, or was it because they were made to do it by some idiot regulators somewhere along that. Like, there's no reason they should have your passport. So, so this issue of going for a world in which you have this kind of weird digitized identity where you're trying to kind of make these digital analogs of what happens in the real world, like Anne said, showing your driving license in a bar. No, that's not what you lot should be building. We should be building a digital identity infrastructure using the concepts that you outlined. And that will be an identity infrastructure which is founded on credentials and not identity. That's why I was so interested in Anne's point about attributes and credentials. Dave, we'll come anyway, on to slide two. <laughs> we'll come on to the. Uh, we'll come on to the to the detail of that uh, to, to that um, identity infrastructure sure. in a second. But I want to pick up on one point because you made a really crucial issue, which is that in most cases, organisations just need to know as, am I a person? And indeed, the way what we are fundamentally doing is we are answering that question: Am I a person? And the way that the privacy of our structures work is we never know who that person is. We may say, in some cases, this, this face looks like the trusted face, but we don't need to know that, who that person is. And in many, sometimes we don't even do the match, but the key test is, are they a person? Now, some organizations that we talk to go, we're happy to use something really quite, quite weak and easily broken. I, I like to say, it's, you, know, you may as well put an I am a person button on, the, on it, just you know, say press the iron button, but they're like capture. Why do you think organizations? It's the other way around, actually. The, num the number one thing I want from ChatGPT 
is to be able to do those puzzles that prove it's not a robot. Because every time I get those wrong, every single stupid time, I'm trying to log into something in a hurry, and I'm like, is that a moped or a motorbike? Like, I don't even know. That's if a chat GPT could fix that, it would actually be onto something. Look, look, this point about the difference between knowing it's a person and knowing which person is really, really important. That credentials-based approach is it so. What we want to do is we want to stop people from using any kind of personally identifiable information in, in transactions. I don't hold for what, if somebody else comes along in a minute and says, oh, we have to put people in charge of their identity. Like, you are literally insane. That's the stupidest idea I ever heard. You put people in charge of their identity, and the first thing they'll do is give it to Facebook for a Mars bar or something. Like, that's mad. You know, you, you, you know the phrase, you require... If you're going to manage identity in this new world, you're going to manage your credentials and stuff. You will require what they call in the industry persistent competence. And I don't have persistent competence. I count myself as a normal person. Normal people don't have persistent competence. You, do you think you have persistent competence? You're looking very confident, but I don't think you do. A persistent competence, really? I lose my keys three times a week. I have one of those tile things to try and find. If my whole life depends on I've got to manage this little this piece of hardware with some keys in it, or, uh, and, and then when I'm not using it, I'm going to wrap it in tin foil and put it in a biscuit tin and bury it in my backyard. Just the way I, it's never going to happen. If you put people in charge of their identity, you're giving it away. People aren't, and I'm not saying it because like, I'm, please don't take me away. I, I didn't finish. Oh, I thought it was the police again. Sorry. <laughs> was, that's, sorry, that happened last time. We, we, the issue is, how can we do that for people? It's not about putting people in charge of their identity. It's about giving people some control. It's not about self-sovereign identity. It's about, you might want to use the technologies of self-sovereign identity, but it's about custodial self-sovereign identity. To your point, when I drop my phone down the toilet, I want the bank to get my identity back. So do, do the thought experiment. Do, just do the simple thought experiment. A mysterious comet comes through the atmosphere and wipes out all of your money. Like, that's annoying, right? But I can go down the bank and borrow some more money. I'll get by. Like, all my money is wiped out. I can go and sell some of my stocks or something, or I get a loan. All my money is wiped out. That's recoverable. If a mysterious comet comes over and my identity gets wiped out, I'm screwed. Next time I go to the ATM, it'll be, who the hell are you? I'll go in the bank to complain. We've never heard of you. It's a disaster. You have to, so what we want is regulated institutions. It doesn't have to be banks. But we want regulated institutions to look after people's data for them and give them some control. So what we do is we keep the people's personal data locked up in the bank vaults and we give them credentials which are facts about the data not the data to Anne's point when you go to the bar they get the credential that says you're over 37 or whatever it is in New York to get a drink they don't get your date of birth or who you are so how close are we to doing that actually a lot closer than we used to be I'm, I'm more optimistic than so I so that's the question how close are we one of the concerns that I've started to hear circulating here at Mobile Congress for the first time, and I've been listening for it for a while, is that in order for the, verified, the distributed identity ecosystem really to take off, it needs a business model, and no one has a clue what a real practical business model that would power such, a, uh, such an industry might look like. What makes you optimistic that this is going to start moving without a business model? Well, I don't say it's without a business model, but the business model has to be something that makes sense for everyone, you know, obviously. It has to make sense for all the stakeholders. So would I want to pick an example? I mean, I'm not saying I'm choosing the example for this audience, but, but for example, would I like to log into Pornhub with my passport and driving license? Of course not. That's why I use Andrews. But that's not the point this afternoon. The point is, you know, is it valuable to me in France, where it's about to become compulsory to access adult sites with an appropriate age verification credential? as it should be in the UK, but currently isn't. Anne was exaggerating a little bit earlier on. We, we, we said we have a framework for, we, I mean, we have, we have a beta version of a framework that, you know, there's gonna be a working group that will discuss the feasibility at some point of conducting a study to look into the possibilities. of But you, you get my general point. There are business models around this. 
And maybe there's some business models people don't want to talk about. But when I was at Money 2020 in Las Vegas, oh yeah, yeah, no, I was, yeah, it's Money 2020 Las Vegas. I'm all over the place, B. I chaired the gambling, drugs, and porn session. It's my dream session, really. I mean, they didn't even have to ask me twice. Uh, the point is, there are business models out there, but historically, we've been a little bit uncomfortable with some of those. I can't tell you how many business models I've worked on for banks and telcos, where the number one business model was adult services, the number two was internet dating. The amount of fraud in internet dating is absolutely astronomical. It goes on all the time. Now you've got, in the UK, where fraud is completely out of control, you can remember in the UK we don't have any ID infrastructure or cards at all. Um, we, think, we think ID cards are symbols of continental tyranny. We associate them with Napoleon and things like that. So we have no identity infrastructure at all. Authorized push payment fraud, instant payment fraud, is absolutely out of control. It is in America too because of Zelle. You know? So you say there's no business models. That's not true. There's lots of business models where people are looking at these issues, like fraud in instant payments, like you know, you know, all sorts of bad things going on in internet dating, like access to adult services, where actually the underlying problem is digital identity. There is a business model, but you've got these fragmented ways. And also, we're, we're too ready to swallow the cost of fraud. Like we're too, we're too comfortable putting up with it. Fraud in the UK is tens of billions of pounds every year. And we just sort of got used to it. And I think you know, digital identity is a way of dealing with a lot of these different things together. But in order for it to happen, we need certain things in place. As Anne was saying, we need banks to play a role in that, of course. Telcos, I think, I don't know, I don't know if there's anybody here as old as me can remember like 25 years ago going to the GSMA mobile ID kickoff meeting. I think it was in Nice or Cannes or somewhere like that. The telcos blew this. They could have had it and they blew it. But they do have, or at least they had, the key element of secure hardware, which was the SIM. And um, because of what I was saying about control and stuff that we don't want to talk about, so with keys and certificates and all the other boring things we need to keep away from members of the public, we do kind of need to store private keys in secure hardware. And that could have been the SIM. It's not going to be, but it could have been. So now it's going to be the secure element that you get in iPhones and Android phones well, and so well, on. I have to say, Dave, I was talking today earlier with someone who is storing that information on eSIMs, independently of the mobile operators, but it's coming back. By the time we, our discussion has got Who, to... Who's that? Adult, uh, by the time we've got to adult gambling well, could you uh, and, 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 and uh, d discussing the... Uh, the failures of the mobile operators, perhaps we should pause a second and, uh, and ask questions and I'll offer, invite questions from yeah. the audience yeah, totally if there right. are any, because otherwise I've got some more for you. Has, are there any, uh, put your hand up high to ask questions. There we go. Hi, good afternoon. Your, your last point around the device being an integral part of the user's identity. What's your take on the future of that? I mean, how important is things like device fingerprinting and linking that to someone's online identity? Um, how important is that in authentication going forward? I, you know, look, personally, I, I'm a very big believer in very strong biometric authentication against keys that are stored in tamper-resistant hardware. Biometric identification, I'm much less comfortable. You know, in, in the great sweep of cases, I mean, occasionally there'll be a need to step up and do biometric identification, like if you're launching nuclear missiles or something. I, I mean, I imagine they have pin codes and things as well, but they probably do some sort of face thing. But for the vast majority of transactions that we're all involved in day to day, strong biometric authentication is all that's needed. And actually, we have that because all of everyone in this audience has got a smartphone already has some sort of biometric authentication. Whether it's fingerprint or... I'm not sure, because I have a feeling if we're having this discussion in three or four years' time, the behavioral biometrics people will have made some pretty good progress by then. So I kind of imagine that, that by that time, when I go to log into something, like, like the bank will say, is this Dave? And the phone will know. It'll be like, yeah, 
well, he's holding the phone the way Dave holds the phone. He's pressing the buttons the way Dave presses the buttons. He's somewhere Dave is normally. He's doing something Dave. You know what? It's Dave. Just it's Dave. Get on with it. And then if it's a nuclear missile, then we'll think about face and stuff like that. So I'm actually pretty optimistic on the authentication side. I think that looks good. I think we have the hardware, we have the standards, because we've got both the W3C and the MDL standards in place now. And remember, you've got part seven of the MDL standards coming uh, in a year or two, is it, Michael? I mean, it's, it's soon, right? It's not infinitely far away. And so then you'll be able to present those credentials online. We, we have all the building blocks we need to make that work. And as you've, you've demonstrated, the technology that anchors it underneath it all is there in place as well. So I think... I think it's right to be more optimistic about it, even while noting at this instant it's all a gigantic mess and fraud is completely out of control. Shall we steal one more question? Over there. Last word. Appropriately, Ralph, Ralph, you get the last word, but you'll need a microphone. Uh, my name is Ralph Simon from Mobilium. David, which countries do you think at the moment, from what you've observed, really have a cohesive, well-organized identity system that can sustain. Obviously, you're always going to get these incursions from bad actors and so forth, but which countries would you say are in the premiership of protective cover? Actually, at this instant, I, I tend to look towards Australia a lot, actually, because in, in Australia, they have the framework in place now, and they have the first couple of people playing in the frameworks, MasterCard and Australia Post and so on. But they also have uh, what they call CDA, the Consumer Data Act. So we have open banking, uh, and we're going to move to open finance and then move to open data. But they're starting with open data, so they're starting with the CDA. So it seems to me that combination of some sort of framework where you can have the digital identities, plus access to the data that gives it kind of energy, makes it useful, is a really interesting combination. So, so not perfect, um, but I but I do lend, I do tend to look at Australia at the moment as as moving forward um, ahead of other people. And I, and I think actually that framework based approach, which was taken up also by Canada, New Zealand. I know I sound very Anglo centric here, but it'll be taken up by the UK as well. And in time, I think it will probably come to the US too. I do think that framework. You know, you you, you said there are those different. I, I do think the framework-based approach is the best way forward, I do. Dave, thank you very much indeed. We've no, more than exhausted our time. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand of applause for David Birch.